So after some very minor technical difficulties, we are actually able to start. So thanks, everybody. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do, as you know, is um, expose the entire province to the great work that's being done in di the different provincial committees. So it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. John Antonson, who is a UBC um, medical student and resident grad who actually did extra training, who did his nephrology training in Seattle at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, and uh, is currently the chair of um, the, med the advisory, the um, provincial hemodialysis group, but also the medical director of the Vancouver Island Health uh, Renal Program. And he's had a lot of experience with both administration and hemodialysis and was one of the people that was in instrumental in um, making sure that we have a, a good strategy for Section 51, so-called, whenever we identify problems in, in um, dialysis and how we can talk about them across different health authority boundaries and, and things like that. So um, the hemodialysis committee does a lot of work, and I thought it would be important for John to uh, update us with respect to the kind of work, academic, clinical, and otherwise. So I'm going to turn it over to you and hopefully stimulate your discussion. This is my microphone? Yes. Okay. So I'll stand way over here and you guys come over. <laughs> uh, I was thinking while I was having my coffee outside that the last time I stood up in front of an audience at St. Paul's Hospital was 25 years ago in Hurlburt. And I don't know if you guys remember, if you older guys remember, but I think Angus used to have these things for residents to potted presentations. Do they still do them? No. no, they're done? Yeah, so I gave a potted presentation and it wasn't very good, but my, my thesis, which was not very original, was that the GI tract is the same as the nephron. Uh -huh. And I did a compare and contrast stuff about the mouth being like the glomerulus, which is freely filtering and all this stuff, and the colon being the, the final processing thing. In any case, I'm back here 25 years later, which means I've got 25 more years to go before I do another one, I guess. Um, the, the hemodialysis committee fired up about five years ago, and, and there's been uh, a lot of work. Some of it um, is sort of just little dotting I's and crossing T's, getting some things written down, and so I'm not going to take you through all that. Um, today, my intention is to talk for a few minutes about where we're at with dialysis results in British Columbia compared to the rest of Canada, uh, or start show you a little bit about where we're at with dialysis in general in British Columbia, and then compare where we're at in British Columbia with uh, core data from the rest of Canada, and uh, maybe the, the conclusion from that part of my presentation will be that uh, the data is problematic, which is always um, what we say when we talk about big, big registry data results, right? Um, and then we'll spend a little bit of time uh, reviewing what we've been up to in the hemodialysis committee. i will talk to you about some of our accomplishments. Some of those things are fairly dry and banal, and some of them are hopefully a little bit more stimulating. Uh, talk about what we're kind of working on now, where we're going next, and that will, if the way I give talks is anything, will take about three hours. So hopefully I'll be able to move, move through this. Uh, I don't have any meaningful disclosures with respect to this. We've all got skeletons in our closet. But. <laughs> Those little dots are the hemodialysis units in British Columbia. Purple ones are in-center units. Yellow ones are community facilities. Look at the interior. I thought the interior was like Tuscany because of all the wine, wine growing areas, but it's actually because there's a renal unit on every corner. Uh, it's quite something. There are currently nearly 3,000 dialysis patients in the province, around not, almost 1,000 uh, peritoneal patients, 180 plus home hemo patients. The focus of the, the talk as far as data goes uh, is going to be based on the hemodialysis, not the home hemodialysis, but just the hemodialysis patients. For the purpose of looking at how we're doing compared to the core data for the country, an incident patient will be considered those that started dialysis between 2015 and 2017. A prevalent patient will be who was on dialysis at Halloween a year ago. And patient survival is um, for the uh, cohort of um, the 2015 to 17 patients whose initial modality was hemodialysis and then how, what happened to their survival, not related to whether they stayed on hemo or not. 
So how do we compare? In large part, we compare favorably. Um, there's a thousand incident patients in those two years in, in British Columbia. Uh, about 22% of them started with a fistula or a graft, which doesn't seem that high, except you compare it to the rest of the country, and which is lower. So we do a little better in the province. That's cool. Um, we have a little bit higher peritoneal dialysis start rate, which if we believe in independence is a good thing. Uh, the modality after 90 days, the rest of the country seems to get people going on uh, uh, independent hemo a little bit quicker, but those are probably small numbers. We're slightly older. We have a few more older, older people. And again, um, looking at the prevalent access, we, once people have been on dialysis for a while, we get more than half of them onto a fistula or a graft compared to the rest of the country, which is sort of 45%. So we know that uh, arteriovenous access is associated with better outcomes, and we like to think that getting fistulas into our patients is going to lead to those better outcomes, so we're happy to see that we're doing, at least compared to our Canadian colleagues, well. Of course, there are other jurisdictions around the planet that do better than we do and it's an area of ongoing effort, and I'll talk about our vascular access initiatives towards the end of my presentation. Uh, some clinical indicators, uh, lab tests and drug use and that sort of thing. Um, lots of us roll our eyes a little bit when we think about whether these lab tests really um, have to do with outcome. We know that high, patients with high phosphorus levels are more likely to do badly than patients with low phosphorus levels, but we don't really know whether fixing phosphorus levels actually makes any difference. So is a high phosphorus level a marker of a bad patient? Not a bad, not a bad behaving patient, maybe a badly behaving patient. Um, but is a high phosphorus level a marker of a patient who's sicker and less well behaving and more likely to have a bad outcome? Or is a high phosphorus level a marker of bad care? And if we can change our care, we're going to improve outcomes. And that's not actually known. There's some interest in uh, maybe looking at that nationally in Canada with the, the phosphate trial that got sent our way recently. So we have more people in uh, control of their parathyroid hormone. We have more people getting more hours of dialysis per week. So you, know, you look at this and, and for some of these clinical indicators that you would, you would uh, in your gut, tell you that maybe they're associated with better outcomes for dialysis patients, you'd say, yeah, we're doing great in British Columbia. Not perfect, we've got areas for improvement, but compared to our colleagues around the country, CORE tells us that um, on these clinical parameters, on average, we're doing a little better. Unfortunately, CORE says that our one-year survival in hemodialysis is 77% compared to a national one-year survival of 81%. And I thought, I thought, why the hell would British Columbia dialysis patients die so fast when we do so much better with accesses and hemoglobins and phosphorus levels and all that stuff? And then it crossed my mind that um, when I look at our provincial survival curves, because I do, um, we've been doing data reviews and in, in renal data reviews in, uh, on Vancouver Island for more than a decade, probably 12, 13 years now. And most of the time when we do one of our data reviews, I get the nice people that promise to send me an updated survival curve showing us how VHOP and Vancouver Island patients are doing compared to the rest of the province and how our PD patients do compared to our hemo patients. And I know, because I look at these survival curves all the time, including two nights ago when I got a fresh set of survival curves for our Wednesday night Vancouver Island data review, I know that on Vancouver Island, our one-year survival rate is around 84%. Um, percent. And I know that Vancouver Coastal's one-year survival rate is around 89%. And I know that the provincial average one-year survival rate is around 85%. And it always is because I've looked at it over and over and over and over again. We always have a one-year survival in the mid-80s, 84, 85, 86, 87 percent. We're never over 90, we're never under 80, we're always in the mid-80s. Mid so I don't know how CORE thinks that our one-year survival rate is 77. If Dr. Hargrove is on over in, Van over in Victoria, she will be sitting muttering under her breath, it's because you don't fill out your CORE forms, John. <laughs> so that's possible. Um, but uh, anyways, I saw that, it, it bothered me, and I just raised it as a flag for data quality. That's all I've got on us versus them. I don't know if there are questions in the room or online. 
But I guess suffice it to say that if for whatever, to whatever extent we believe the, the, the data um, from a clinical standpoint, we're doing well, and I question the uh, survival statistics. All right, the Provincial Hemodialysis Committee. Uh, we've got core committees in the province. There's one for each domain of renal care. Um, there was not one for hemodialysis. We, were, we had good organization around everything up until 2013, and then Adira pulled, pulled myself and some other people aside and said, you know, hemodialysis is the biggest or one of the biggest parts of our business, and we don't have any real organized way about, about looking at it. And so a few of us got together and fired up uh, a hemodialysis committee, and, and we've been going for uh, since early 2014, so coming up on our six-year birthday. Uh, Fairly obvious, I hope, um, but the idea here is that we would have a provincial approach to hemodialysis care so that we can share and learn and improve and document and review and hopefully, uh, in the long run, help others uh, by taking some of the work that we do and writing it down and uh, sharing it uh, through publication. And we've been a bit laggard in those efforts to date, uh, but this is why we meet. We, uh, we have at least one of each, nurse, dietitian, social worker, nephrologist, administrator. We've got, we've got a full complement of people from across the spectrum of, of providers in our renal programs. We get together by video conference every couple of months. Once a year, we get together with a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, in gold, because they deserve it, I put the names of Yuri Melnick and uh, Janet Williams. Uh, they're our, uh, our hemodialysis committee project and, and uh, initiative leads. Without them, we don't do anything, honestly. Um, like for, for example, uh, six weeks ago, we were having one of our little, Yuri and Janet and I have a, every two weeks, we have a, a half hour long telephone call to catch up on where we're at with our work plan and our agenda and what we're, what we're doing with hemodialysis. And I said, at the end of one of those calls, I said, you know, I've been invited to give a summary of hemodialysis stuff at provincial rounds in November. Do you guys have any thoughts or ideas about, uh, about what I should speak to? And Janet said, well, I'll put, put together a few thoughts. And literally about 32 hours later, this slide deck arrived. <laughs> so that's the kind of help we get from uh, Janet Neary. It's fantastic. And Red, I put up there, do you know who your representatives on the hemodialysis committee are? And the, the reason that that's there is it's fine and good for us to have a, a committee of interested people sitting around every couple of months talking about what we're doing in hemodialysis and coming up with practice guidelines and thinking about how to do things better. But at the end of the day, if 20 or 30 or 40 people sit in a room and make those decisions on behalf of hundreds of people that are in the clinics implementing those ideas, it's kind of for naught if, if the work doesn't make it out to the, the health authorities and to the local renal programs. And so one of the reminders or asks um, that we always come up with, and I'm coming up with today, is that people working in hemodialysis should know who in their programs is working on improving hemodialysis care. You should know who's going to these meetings every couple of months, and you should have a, a method or a way of bringing back the, the ideas, guidelines, initiatives from the provincial work and think about how you implement locally. I'll talk about uh, one of our uh, guidelines, about, uh, hopefully briefly in a few minutes, and it'll be important. Implementation is going to be a challenge for that particular guideline. We've done tons of stuff, and I'm going to talk about a few things. Um, it's recognized, uh, and I. Dear, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, recognized uh, in British Columbia first or nearly first uh, before anybody else or with people early on that renal failure is a, a great milia for tuberculosis and that the, the incidence of, of reactivated tuberculosis in the renal failure and dialysis population is meaningful. The, the TB program in Vancouver started publishing on that quite a few years ago, like when I was a young person. And 
it was we had thought in the province that maybe if TB is important in dialysis patients, we should do something about it. And there was a haphazard approach to screening for TB in chronic kidney disease patients around the province from places that sort of did it if there were symptoms to places like Victoria, where if you had a GFR under 30, you got seen at the, you got you got a skin test and a chest X-ray, and we were checking everybody. There was a, a thought about making a, a better effort with respect to coordinating what we do around TB, and there's now a program in place. It's not just for hemo patients. It's, it's anybody that comes to dialysis gets screened for latent tuberculosis, and um, we had a provincial rounds on it uh, some months ago, so I'm not going to get into it too much. There's a whole guideline on the website. Uh, this is the proportion of patients that have been screened as of uh, the three different time periods there and as of uh, their hospital. Yay Jubilee in Victoria, 100%, 100%, 100%. That's because we've actually been screening for TB in everybody since forever, and so it wasn't news to us that we should screen for TB. And you can see there are others that are sort of working on getting better at getting their new dialysis patients screened. In the initial pilots, looking at uh, what screening turned up, I think there were 14, 15%, I think it was St. Paul's there, if I remember right, but uh, there were 14, 15% of patients screened turned up with evidence of latent tuberculosis, and so it's a meaningful number. In the initial uh, screening efforts uh, after this uh, formalized program got underway, 13% turned up as having evidence of latent tuberculosis. If you think that there are 700-ish new dialysis patients in the province on an annual basis, there were 900 and something in that um, core data from a two-year two sample. If you think that there's around 700 a year in hemo and PD patients in the province, we're going to pick up 70 or 80 patients a year. And if most of them accept and complete as a prophylaxis, we're going to remove a whole bunch, you know, not three or four people per year. We're going to lose, we're going to remove 40 or 50 or 60 patients per year from uh, from meaningful risk for reactivated tuberculosis. It's impressive. Uh, the acuity scale. For many many years, we've had this thing called the acuity scale, which is implement or is just is verb. I don't have a verb. Is done in uh, dialysis facilities where on a given day. Patients in the dialysis unit are, are rated for how in, unstable their dialysis treatment is. This is not a scale around how much work they are. It's not are they crazy or sad or need to have their drugs readjusted or whatever. It's really around how stable are they, what, what actual um, uh, chores are required at the bedside to safely get them through a dialysis run. So it's a lot around hemodynamic instability and number of drips hung and that sort of thing. Uh, this was done um, less formally for many years, and we formalized it with the, with the reboot of version two of the acuity scale, which added a little bit more information around patient frailty, um, like do they need help getting in and out of the, chair, the dialysis chair or bed or whatever. Um, and for the last two or three years, we've been every six months, we've been asking dialysis units around the province to do a one-time a one snapshot acuity measurement of patients in their unit. And we're now able to tell over time what's happening to acuity because you, I think everyone knows who works in a hemodialysis unit in British Columbia, they're getting sicker, they're getting harder, there's more work, these patients aren't what we used to take care of, we, you hear it all the time, How, we need more nurses, we need to. So um, we now measure the acuity scale every six months and lo and behold, uh, it, it's rated up to five, so five would be patient who's in shock and needs to go to the ICU, and one would be a patient who comes in and flips you the bird and watches TV for three hours. The, um, you can see that over time, the numbers are actually creeping up slowly. Uh, a patient with an acuity score of three out of five would be moderately active in terms of their, the care they need during dialysis. We broke it down um, to look at what it's like for patients dialyzing in a hospital versus out in community units with the idea that hospitals probably keep all the patients that are a lot more challenging and that community units would not. And we've been hearing for a long time that our, our more remote community units are taking care of sicker and sicker patients. Uh, you, you, I know that if, if a patient lives up in Campbell River, they don't want to drive to Nanaimo three times a week or be driven to Nanaimo three times a week for the dialysis. So we kind of stretch it and figure out a way to get them into the Cumberland dialysis unit and maybe they've got 
open wounds and blood pressures of 75, and uh, but we still we still try to figure out how to provide care for them in Cumberland. So you can see that the rural remote community units are, are in between the less acute urban, urban community units and the in-center units, but they're actually a little bit closer to what in-center units look like. So we're, we're functionally, in some places, in, in our more remote community dialysis facilities, we are dialyzing patients that are closer to what we are dialyzing in in-center, middle of the city, big hospital units. And that's helpful for us to remember that when we hear from our nurses and our staff out in the periphery telling us that they're dialyzing sick people, they're, they're right, they are. Now, uh, I'm not sure where it is in my slide deck, but I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our CDF best practice guideline. Oh, this just came two days ago. Um, we've, some of you will know that in British Columbia we've been doing this acuity scale. We're trying to use it to, to assess what's going on, to maybe help us plan for resource allocation and that sort of thing. And people have gnashed their teeth back and forth about does it help, doesn't it help. And then some people in Ontario said, hey, can we use your acuity scale? And they did. They took the BC acuity scale and they, looked, they uh, used it to assess what was going on in their units and they found out how acute their patients were and they made some changes in staffing and, and that sort of thing. And now they've got a nice little paper, uh, poster summary about what they did and they're moving forward. So uh, good on us for making the acuity scale, good on us for perfecting it, good on Ontario for using it and making their programs better. So we're going to try and hopefully in British Columbia use things like our acuity scale to improve care in our units. Maybe I will, here. The, while I'm talking about community units, uh, we, this was about a two-year project uh, of working group looked at care and community dialysis facilities. And we now have a, on the website a published community dialysis unit uh, uh, best practice paper. And it's long, it's many, many pages, but what it goes into is what kind of uh, care could be provided reasonably in a community dialysis facility and what resource might be important to support that care. So if a, if a patient needs a lift to get out of their wheelchair into a bed for their dialysis, and your community dialysis facility does not have beds and doesn't have lifts, then maybe they can't dialyze that patient in their community, di community dialysis facility. But there's no rule that says if your patient needs to have a lift to get into their dialysis bed or chair, they're not allowed to dialyze in their community. They have to, they have to move to a big city to get their dialysis. There's no rule that says that, but there needs to be an understanding around what kind of resource or facility is necessary to support the care of a patient out in the community. And so this community best practices paper goes into great detail around different types of uh, care issues that a hemodialysis patient might have and what would be necessary to support them out in the community. And if your community unit can provide it, then they can take care of that patient. And if they can't, then you have reason to say, look patient, look patient's family, look administration. This is what we have in Fort St. John. And what we don't have in Fort St. John is all the things necessary to take care of Bob. And we've, we've got it codified. Uh, I remember many, many years ago, we had a, a provincial chin wag at the Vancouver airport. Everybody from outside of Vancouver flew to the airport and everybody from inside Vancouver drove to the airport and we all met at a hotel at the airport. And one of the things that we came up with was a, was a conversation with the docs about can't we standardize patients traveling around the province. Like, this is crazy where our, our patients are struggling getting a, if one of my guys wants to go and uh, do a week in Kelowna, how come I can't get my patient a unit, uh, run in Kelowna? And everyone's got different rules. And so the docs drew up this uh, set of documents for visiting patients. And guess what? The docs didn't consider all of the stuff that's required. And so those documents fell by the wayside. Fast forward, we've now got a provincial hemodialysis committee with representatives from all the different disciplines and we again brought up the issue that patient travel is an, impo is an important thing to support and it would be really good if we could have a common set of rules and guidelines around what's necessary to support that patient in getting their travel and with the help of not just the doctors but the nurses and the CNLs and the administrators and the people that do the scheduling, we came up with a, a package of a traveling package for patients tra going around the province. And so we now all play by the same rules. 
If you, you need to have this kind of documentation, you have to have a med list, this is what we need to know about your dialysis prescription, these are the contact numbers, this is where you find out about, the, all that stuff is now um, written down in this travel package. And so when, now when my patient wants to go to Kelowna, we can just pick up the provincial travel documents, sign them off, and, and Kelowna knows what they're going to get, and hopefully they get it. I can tell you from our perspective on Vancouver <laughs> Island, we get way better communication since these documents are available. This is, a, this is a document that's probably going to be an iterative work, ongoing work in progress. But we now have a completed BC hemodialysis welcome guide, welcome to the hemodialysis unit. So patient transitions from the emergency room where they didn't know their kidneys were dead this morning to dialysis or they've been followed by their nephrologist in this kidney care clinic for the last five years and now they're on dialysis. We thought it would be a good idea to have an organized way of helping the patient understand what life in a dialysis unit is like, what's expected of them, what they can expect from us, how things work, and uh, so there's this nice document. Uh, I haven't talked to Gloria yet, Adira, but uh, we've had an ask uh, from patients on the island that we not always just give them booklets. They would like to have um, easy-to-use web-based information. And so that might be a bit of work for us to, to do in the future is to take what, what might be in a, a pamphlet and make it into a website that they can click through and, and find their way around. Mm -hmm. Not just a web-based PDF, but an actual web-based, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the uh, things that we task ourselves with in the hemodialysis committee is safety. Uh, and under sort of the quality rubric, we, we like to think that we can improve the safety of hemodialysis around the province. And we use the committee as a venue for sharing critical incidents. Every, every time we have a meeting, one of our, we have a standing agenda item around critical incidents. And I thought it was going to be something that would just be a, a place for us to remember that, oh, yeah, we should think about that. Turns out every freaking time we have a meeting, somebody's had a critical, somebody's had an incident in their dialysis unit. And it's, uh, it's a good place for us to hear that a bad thing happened. This is how the uh, risks were mitigated, and then the rest of us can learn so that if it happens in our unit, uh, we'll do better. Just in the last year, year and a half, uh, there have been several, and these are uh, perhaps the three more important ones. Uh, just over a year ago, I got a phone call from a nurse educator up island on Vancouver Island saying, I'm sorry to call you and tell you that uh, one of our nurses, when she was taking down the machine, found blood behind the lure lock on the venous transducer protector. And we don't know how blood got inside the machine. Well, the bomb went off, and in days gone by, we would not have had a, 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 a way to handle this provincially. It would have just been handled locally, and people would have been off in their own little unit just trying to figure out what the hell was going on. But because we had this provincial committee, we were able to take photographs, convene a quick little uh, communication group on the phone to say, FYI, this was found in, uh, on Vancouver Island. We're not sure what it was. We're worried that it might be blood getting in the wrong place of a dialysis machine. Anybody who uses these machines, be aware that you should be starting to look in this part of your machine to see whether there's blood in your machine. So it was a, it was a good way of, of handling it. Turns out, at the end of it all, as best as we could tell, it was not blood. It was corroded metal, and uh, the learning from that, apart from just how to, how, to vet, how to work our way through a critical incident, was also <laughs> that we had to work with the vendor and call them up and say, how come your parts are corroding? And they're like, well, you, you're not washing them properly. And then we said, well, how are we supposed to wash their, them properly if we can't get them wet? And they said, oh, well. So there's, it, it allowed this facility to um, have a meaningful conversation with the vendor about how to improve what's going on with the machine. Um, I can tell you there was a lot of sweating and gnashing of teeth because for those of you that are too young to remember, many, many years ago with, uh, with an older type of machine, we actually did find blood in, like, like inside the, the cabinet of a, hemo, of a bunch of hemodialysis machines. And it, it, that led to a big investigation. And we it changed the way that dialysis tubing is hooked up to machines and that. Um, and, uh, some of you will know that a few months ago uh, there were all of a sudden a bunch of units around the province noticed that with a certain family of dialyzers that they were getting air leak detects 
and that the, the uh, fibers in the dialyzers were leaking. Uh, for those of you that are not hemodialysis oriented, in hemodialysis we run blood through a filter and on the other side of the filter there's non-human. And yes, they're supposed to uh, diffuse and osmose and UF stuff across the filter, but they're not supposed to actually break and mix directly. And so the machines have sensors on them that can tell you when, when the dialyzer uh, membranes crack or break. And that happens every now and then. But every now and then is like every now and then. Like a, there's, that's not a common thing. And all of a sudden, within days, we were getting reports from around the province that, uh, that a certain manufacturer's uh, uh, stable of dialyzers were cracking. And so we were able to have, again, an immediate get together, get all the chemo leads around together, find out what's going on, and then broadcast around to the, pro the programs and say, this is going on, watch out for these dialyzers, maybe we should take this particular brand of dialyzers off the shelf until we know what's going on. So that was a, an important safety thing. Within two weeks of each other, uh, last December, there was a patient in the north and there was a patient on Vancouver Island who were found lying in a pool of their own blood uh, in shock and with their dialysis machine having not turned off in time. And in both circumstances, the venous needle, uh, the blood return needle into, in their fistula had come out of their arm and had gotten caught in their pajamas or their $5 blanket or whatever. And the machine just merrily kept on pumping and took the patient's blood out of them and pumped it into their bed rather than back into them. And because we have this provincial quality structure, we were able to hear about this, have a big think about how we handle venous needles. And there was an initial concern around whether or not the sensors on the machine were working properly. And so we were able to work with the vendor to go back and open up the black boxes and the just like an airplane have black boxes, hemodialysis machines have black boxes. So we were able to take them out, go in and look and find out what the machine thought it was doing at the time that the, the needle came out. And so we now have uh, uh, a draft guideline around management of dialysis needles. Um, you would have thought that over since 1962, when Scrib made his little shunt and they eventually figured out this, the fistulas, you would have thought in the last 50 or 60 years that we would have had a proper understanding around how to manage dialysis needles in a dialysis run. Turns out people more or less know, but it's not written down. So we're writing it down. I've written section 51 on the bottom of this slide um, because that's an area of ongoing effort. I don't know if we're going to talk about it. This, maybe we're going to talk about it this morning at the executive committee meeting. Section 51 is a section of uh, the Provincial Health Care Act that allows for the uh, unfettered, protected conversation and discussion around critical uh, safety events in patient care. It allows for doctors and nurses and technicians and anybody who's involved in a bad thing happening to sit in a room and say, what happened? And they can say out loud without being worried that they're going to go to jail. You can say, I think that doctor screwed up and walked by the dialysis machine and turned it on a million when he should have turned it down to two. And why are doctors touching dialysis machines and the doctor's got to get spanked. And so the, you can have those kind of conversations um, where the, the, de the nitty gritty details are not able to be put into a court. The resulting recommendations like doctors shouldn't touch dialysis machines, that can be, or that can be publicly uh, made knowledge, but the Dr. Bob came by and pushed the wrong button and killed the patient, that, that information can be kept in, in the inside the room, protected. Now, Section 51 is by organization. It, uh, so what I mean by that is, for example, uh, the Vancouver Island Health Authority has the, author has the authority of the auspice to have Section 51 protected meetings around stuff that happens on Vancouver Island. And Vancouver Coastal can have Section 151, Section 51 protected meetings around stuff that happens in this building. What's not easily figured out is how to have a provincial discussion. And in order to do that, we have to have every health authority has to bless that they can share stuff, cross-pollinate, and we're in the process of getting this figured out so that when, probably on HEMA more than any other part of renal care, we have critical incidents. And so we're hoping um, that we're going to have 
the ability to have protected conversations where we get into this. We're having the conversations anyways, but um, we're working on getting the legal authority to have our conversations protected under Section 51. We already talked about the CDU uh, best practice paper. Oh, uh, here's this is a fun little thing. Um, we had a conversation in one of our meetings. Our dietitians on the committee came and said, what do you guys think about patients eating on dialysis? Who's got rules around that? And we all went, uh, uh. And so our dietitians went off and did a survey. And they've got a manuscript. And they're looking at how do hemodialysis units handle the issue of whether patients can eat, when can they eat, what can they eat? Can you tell a patient not to eat? during dialysis. The patient puts food in their gut when they're on a hemodialysis machine. Their blood goes to their gut instead of to their head and they pass out sometimes. And there are potentially, there's potential for restricting access to food during a dialysis run, but then we get into patient right to live at risk and all those kind of conversations. So hats off to uh, Karen Perinas over at Vancouver General. Uh, she's one of the dietitians on our committee, and she's working with uh, her colleagues over at that hospital running this little project, and it's an example of something a little bit more academic that we're hoping, hopefully trying to move our work into. Yeah. Um, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about vascular access, uh, dialysis, fistulas, and grafts. Uh, we're, we have a little working group that's going to get bigger uh, to revamp the quality indicators that we use to assess uh, our vascular access programs. Uh, we get these vascular access reports, which are great because they give us a lot of granular detail around, around what's happening around the province with respect to vascular access, but the actual quality indicator data um, tells us where we're good or where we're bad, but it d doesn't tell us why we're good or why we're bad. And so we're hoping to um, revamp the way we collect information around vascular access so that we can learn more uh, about where we can Im make improvements. Not just that we, we, we need to, it's fine to tell us that we need to do better, but helping us understand where we can do better uh, is a perhaps more helpful way of approaching things. So in gray, for those of you who are colorblind, gray is gray. <laughs> in gray is the wait time to have, from the time that you have a decision to do a vascular access procedure until you actually have your procedure. And in orange is the prevalence of grafts or fistulas in your program. We always have said for a long time, if we just had more OR time, we could get our vascular access rates improved. If we could just get our patients into the OR in a timely way, we'd have fewer catheters and we would have better vascular access rates in our province. By looking at this, it seems to me that the programs or the hospitals that have the longest wait times have the most fistulas. So it doesn't make sense. The interior has almost instant access to the operating room. Their median what time wait between a decision to put a fistula in and having a fistula is like days, not weeks. And they have, unfortunately, fistula prevalence rates that are a little bit lower than other parts of the province. Or at least they're not way lower, but they're not way better. And you've got places like Vancouver General and St. Paul's and the island that seem to have a long time to get the get their patients in the OR, and especially at St. Paul's and Vancouver General, they've got better rates. So it's not just about getting your patient in the OR quickly. It's about getting the right patients in the system. And so we're, we've got this group looking at what data we need to understand what's, what the flow of patients through a vascular access program is so that we can help our colleagues figure out which patients need to have a fistula and then push them through to execute their vascular access plan as, as efficiently as possible. So this is a little rubric uh, around, around flow of patient uh, through a vascular access program. Uh, if you go backwards from the right-hand side, that the patient starts on dialysis with a fistula, they have to actually have an access ready to go. In order for them to have an access ready to go, they have to have an access created. In order to have an access created, they have to have had a, rec a, a, a booking card. In order to have a booking card, they have to have, have had to have seen the surgeon and signed a consent form. 
And in order to have that, that happen, they have to have a consult, they have to be referred, they, and before they get referred, they have to agree that maybe having a fistula is a good idea. In order to agree that if having a fistula is a good idea, they have to know that hemodialysis is the plan. And for you to have the hemodialysis be the plan, you have to actually identify the patient as threatening renal disease and that dialysis might be one of their options and that they pick hemo. So if you think about what should happen to get best outcomes for, for vascular access, all of those things need to happen in a timely way and in good support of patient care. And telling me that I have a 19% fistula incidence rate doesn't tell me whether I didn't tell, teach my patient about dialysis options or whether the patient refused to see a surgeon or after they saw the surgeon, the surgeon said, this is what I'm gonna do to you, they said, talk to the hand, or whether they, they saw the surgeon, agreed to have surgery, and when they were called and said, okay, your surgery's on Tuesday, they said, well, actually, Tuesday we're having puppies, and so I can't come then. Like, where, like, we need to, we have, it'd be helpful to have more information around, around where we're helping the patient on each of those points in the pathway. It's possible that on Vancouver Island, we have low fistula rates because we refer too late. Maybe we're so jaded by long waiting times for the OR that we go, ah, screw it. What's, what's the point of sending a patient to see the surgeon? They're never gonna have an operation anyways. But if we have, low, if we have late or low referral rates, I need to know that because maybe I could do better by my patients by helping them get referred in a more timely way. So, We're likely going to come up, with, this is, a, in, this is a, an in-work, in-process bit of work. We're hoping to come up with a set of metrics that will, will help programs understand at each important point along a patient's journey through a vascular ac access plan and execution, how are you doing as a program? In order for that to work, we have to have our KCC and dialysis unit staff docs, think about that and actually enter data. They have to, you have to put in, patient was, patient was identified as requiring um, dialysis education. They got, did they get it, yes or no? If they got it, did they decide, yes or no? Is the hemodialysis the plan? All that kind of stuff, I mean, it, it should be in there, and in theory it is in there, but if it's not in there, we're not gonna get very good information with our quality reports. So uh, just as an example on the bottom there, I've written, you know, maybe incidence should not be the number of patients who start hemodialysis with a fistula among those that were known for more than six months. That's our current definition of an incident dialysis fistula. Patient known to the renal program for more than six months started hemo with a fistula. Well, the denominator might not be right because in patients started hemodialysis and was known, were known for more than six months, there are patients for whom a fistula was not the plan. Maybe it was not the plan because the doc said, we're not gonna take you through this. Or maybe it's not the plan because the patient said, oh yeah, I was in the clinic and I saw someone with one of them big wormy things in their arm. There's no freaking way you're doing that to me. So they're not gonna consent to having a fistula done. And so to, to count patients where a fistula was not the plan in the denominator of how you're assessing whether or not you've done a good job maybe doesn't make sense. And so uh, I, I'm saying that by way of uh, pointing out that, that hopefully we'll end up with a set of metrics where we're considering the right patients, we're measuring them at the right time, and we will be able to figure out where in our program we can do a better job of getting the correct access into a dialysis patient. If a catheter is the correct access, they should be counted as a success if they have a catheter. All right, last minute or two. Um, what's next for, for hemodialysis in British Columbia? Um, uh, we are provincially around all of renal care thinking more and more about evaluation. Um, in, in the hemodialysis c committee, as much or more than anybody, we have done a ton of stuff. We've, done, we've got guidelines and all kinds of things going on. Um, and we, we just get them out there but we don't always ask, did it help, did it make a difference, did, was it implemented properly? If we said we were gonna clean machines this certain way, are the people actually cleaning the machines a certain way or is, it, is there a problem with implementing? Can they not get the cleaning solution, whatever. Um, so thinking about uh, how to go back and reflect or evaluate <coughs> the results of our work so we can do better the next time we do it is, is something that we're actively thinking about in our committee. I said earlier, uh, I asked you earlier if you know who in your program is on the hemodialysis committee or on the peritoneal dialysis committee or on the palliative care committee. Do you know who in your program are your, are your leads and do you have an operational or a way of operationalizing 
their efforts. So when the, there's provincial work on, on uh, an initiative in hemodialysis, does every health authority renal program have a way to operationalize the, the attempts at improving care? Uh, I've written quite big there, uh, workforce strategy project. Uh, this is a, a big ticket item for our committee. I think uh, those of you that work in hemodialysis units are fully aware of the fact that there aren't very many hemo nurses around anymore, or at least there aren't any new ones, or if there are new ones, they don't come very fast. And after having a decade or so of, pa of stability of patient numbers, we're now starting to see an uptick again. There are more and more patients coming to hemodialysis. And if we don't have qualified staff to hook them up and run them, we're going to have to ration dialysis, and that's not okay. And we're, we are recognizing that um, having available uh, staff or workforce to provide for hemodialysis care is a challenge. And so there's a, a project going on led by Warren Hill out in Fraser, but with other administrative and um, staff members looking at what care is necessary in a hemodialysis unit, what kind of person, what kind of provider could help with that care, and what are your options for figuring out how to staff a unit so that you can make best use of the expertise in your care providers. Patient voice is increasingly recognized as critical in care. Patient voice is especially critical in chronic disease management care. And that's what we do in renal. We do chronic disease management. We on he the HEMO committee are, are actively working on and thinking about and planning for how we are going to find place and venue for patient voice. Is it helpful to have a patient sitting in a room talking about how to clean a dialysis machine? You might say no. On the other hand, what if your patient is somebody who knows about that kind of stuff, knows about chemicals? Maybe it's a chemical engineer on dialysis who can come in and actually speak to it. So um, we're, we're thinking about where we can find places for patient voice, and we want to make sure that, that patients participate in the, the planning and the things we're doing to improve uh, care. Submit articles for publication. We're not very good at that. I'll confess it. We, we're doing tons of work. We're cranking out guidelines. We're putting up uh, 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 best practice papers. Um, we've got people in Ontario using our stuff to do their work, and they're publishing on it. But we're not very good at sharing our efforts with the rest of the renal community on the planet. And uh, all I'll say is we recognize that that's something that we need to work on, and, uh, and we're going to work on it. But uh, it, it, it's a next phase part of our efforts. That's my finish slide, so I will stop and enter entertain questions. But before you say or ask anything, um, I want to again acknowledge Yuri and Janet, uh, my, my co-leads on the hemodialysis committee, because they are the people that push all of these things forward. And without them, we would basically not be doing any coordinated work on hemodialysis in the province. Thank you. Questions or comments from people? So I think there's a huge amount of work, and I, it might be worthwhile reminding the people that don't know that it's all volunteer, right? Like the committees are volunteers. Yuri paid. gets paid. Yuri's paid. Yuri's paid. <laughs> <laughs> and Janet is paid. But the committee members do this because what they're doing in their local world can be extrapolated to province and vice versa, yeah. and so it's a model that is not, not well understood by lots of people. Yeah, it, it, it's true. I, I'll tell you, Adira, um, it's absolutely true. Um, people are taking time out of their professional life to come and, and do work that will help their local work and help more broadly, and that's, that's important. But no surprise to you, any of you who work in renal, guess what? They're really passionate. Um, people, people show up um, in, in these, these critical chronic disease management environments with a lot of energy and passion for making things better. Um, they, they know their patients, not, not for a few hours or for a week or so, they know their patients for months and years, and they can see where there are problems, they can see where they want things to be better, and uh, our, our committee members show up to our meetings with a lot of energy and enthusiasm for trying to make things better, and so hats off to them. Um, but you're right, it's, uh, it's volunteer time. Ask 
Is there anybody uh, that's not in this room on a telephone or in another room around the province that has anything they'd like to tell us to do better in hemodialysis? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll stop there. Thanks, everybody.